So if you have a, a Bible in your pew, you can use that if you don't have a Bible with you. And uh, I usually print my passage out on big font so I don't have to read from my Bible. But it is, it is the new, the, the English Standard Version that your pew Bible is. So that's what we'll be using today. And I think... Right here, I think it's right. So, it doesn't look like it's pointing at me though. That might be a good thing. It is. All right. So, uh, this morning we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. So, if you take your minute and, and uh, turn into uh, Judges chapter 6, and I, I didn't prepare enough to get me a, a. Last time I got me a cup to put my water in. But uh, if you see me move forward, I'm just getting my drink of water. If you use a cup, you always run the, the, the risk of spilling it. <laughs> if you got a cap on it, you're probably not going to spill it. Judges chapter 6. So we're going to read the scriptures this morning. And there's a lot of verses in this chapter, but we're only going to read through verse 18. Right? So instead of, I don't know how many verses it is, but it's a long chapter. But we're going to cover the first part of the story and get some lessons out of it this morning. And, uh, and just let God speak. So if you would, uh, uh, I'll invite you, if you're able and would like to stand, to stand for the reading of God's words. Because we, we, usually we stand for the songs. So now we get a break to stand for the for the reading. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains, and the caves, and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no substance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in, and Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. We're at verse 7. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians from the hand, and from the hand of all who oppressed you. And I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You should not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. All right, we're at 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, 
Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would bless this time that we have together. I pray that you would, uh, your Holy Spirit would do what, what you do and speak to each heart individually. Regardless of, of uh, what the, the message is or who the speaker is, use your word, Lord, and speak to each heart. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. Thank you. So I'm, I take it for, I don't take it for granted. I, I assume everybody may not be familiar with the story of Gideon. So if you're not familiar with this part of the Bible, if you go back a few chapters, you see that there was trouble in Israel, and there was a judge named, a, a woman named Deborah. She was a judge, and there was a man named Barak. This is, this is in the previous three chapters. I'm just going to sum up real quick. And uh, uh, they were being oppressed, um, and God spoke to Barak and said, hey, call for soldiers from three tribes, and then go take care of this for God. And he, he was afraid to do it. And so God showed Deborah, the, the judge, that, hey, I've, I've, I've sent word to Barak to do what he needs to do, and he's just sitting there. And so Deborah calls for Barak to come to her. And Barak goes to her, uh, and, and, and she says, didn't the Lord tell you what to do? And he said, yes. And she said, well, do it. He said, I will do it if you go with me. All right, because Deborah had the respect of the people. People respected her. And so she said, okay, I'll go with you so you'll be a brave man and do what you're supposed to do. And so she went with him. And then afterwards, Deborah reigned as a judge there in Israel for, for 40 years. And then in verse 5, previous to what we're looking at today, there's a, the song of Deborah and Barak. So they wrote a song together after their victory. And the last line, after the poem is over, the song is over in verse 5, the last line, chapter 5, the last line before we hit our story today says, uh, this is from Judges 5, verse 31, and the land had rest for 40 years. And then we pick up the story. And the story uh, goes back to, to the situation in, uh, is there any more slides? Uh, you can advance. Okay, so this is called Gideon and the Problem with Midian. Go ahead. All right, I just covered this. All right, go ahead. There we are. That's where we're at. So, listen to this again. This is what's going on in the land, what Midian did to the people. This is going to go through verse uh, 3. So, the people of Israel did what was even the sign of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Don't forget that seven years. We're going to, we're going to hit, hit, hit that later on. Um, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel built for themselves the dens. Now what this is talking about is after they, they planted their crops and the crops were coming up, getting ready to harvest, and then these people would come in with their soldiers and their, their shepherds and their animals and they would feed on their crops that they had planted to eat through the winter, right? 
And so when the, arm, when the, the armies and the, and the animals came in, remember it says the camels couldn't be numbered, neither could the army. When they would come in, they would go up to the mountain, to the hillside. To, it's like you have a valley. I'm not sure if anybody, I lived in a valley in Arizona. You could see it. Right? Down in the middle, there was the, the stream and the green trees. And then you had all the land, and then eventually either side of the valley, it started going up, and the mountains went up over five, over a mile high. All right? And so uh, they would plant their crops down by the river in the valley, in the flat land, in the bottom land, as some people would call it, because that's the more, more fertile land. But when these, the armies would come in, and their camels, and they would eat up all their, their crop, they would take their take their family and their goats and their servants and go up and they built these dens in, in the, up in the side of the mountain, up high. So they built these dens and they also, and the way it's saying it, Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountain. So this is like after the fact, and they're like, you can still see the dens. You can still see the, the caves and the strongholds that they set up. And a stronghold may have been a place where they would just have a little wall, and they'd stand behind the wall and throw the rocks or the spears down at the soldiers if they came up to harass them. Uh, but they had to live in the caves, in these dens, while they, they were there. They were just overran completely. And they would hightail up to the hills and live up in their caves. That's pretty bad. It's pretty bad when it happened seven years in a row. You planted your crops, they grew, and Right before you were ready to harvest them, in come these hordes of uh, Midianites and their camels. And that's what it says. For whenever the Israelites planted the crops, the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no substance in Israel. No sheep or ox or donkey. So what's left? Did they take their goats up with them in the, in the cave so they can have some milk and cheese maybe? I don't know. What's left? What's left for them to, to, to sustain them, to eat? It, and it, it, this happened for seven years. And you, I would imagine you begin, begin to get tired of that. And verse 5 says, they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people cried out to the Lord for help. And the, the next part says God sent a prophet. But the point is, they were there seven years. And after the first year, they didn't cry out to the Lord for help. And after the second year this happened, they didn't cry out to the Lord for help. The third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Finally, after seven years, seven times it says in verse uh, 6, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Why did they wait? Maybe they're just as thick-headed as we are sometimes. Maybe they don't, they don't seek God first, even when these people are coming in and, and destroying their crops for seven years in a row. It took seven years before they th thought, maybe we should seek God about this and get some help from God. But they finally did. So that's a good thing, right? But why did they wait seven years? It's hard to explain. Reminds me of the pharaohs when the frogs, when the plague of the frogs came in. I don't know if you guys remember this. It's a long time ago. The, frog, the plague of the frog, frogs with, uh, with the Moses, when the, that plague came, the frogs just would cover the land with everybody's house and everybody's way everywhere, on the kitchen table everywhere. And it says, Moses came and said, hey, are you going to let my people go? We can get rid of these frogs. And Pharaoh said, no, no, I'm going to think about it. And so he went another day, another day and a night, with the frogs thinking about it. And there's an old southern gospel song with a line that says, uh, it makes fun of this, and the, it says, one more night with the frogs. Was, I think that was the name of the song. Uh, one more night with these stinking frogs. One more night in sin. Had a terrible time with them last night. 
I just got to do it again. Why are we so thick-headed? Pharaoh was thick-headed. The people of Israel here and judge, uh, judges are thick-headed. And they waited seven years. Now, in this case, in this case, when they cried to the Lord for help, he didn't make the plague of Midian go away. He didn't take them away. He didn't destroy them. He didn't destroy them with, uh, with fire and brimstone. He didn't destroy them with a, a plague of sickness. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't drive them out of the land. What did he do? It says, verse 7, that the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. Now that's, is that what they were hoping for? I don't know. But the Midianites are still there. And God sends a prophet. And the prophet comes and says, in verse, uh, verse 7, he says to them, I'm sorry, it's verse 8. The prophet comes to the people of Israel, he says to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all those who pressed you, and drove them out before you, gave you their land, and I said to you, I'm the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. You should not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So that was the message. So God sent a prophet that just said, you didn't listen to me, you didn't obey. That's, all. That's the message of the prophet. Did that message make the Midianites and their camels disappear? No, it did not. They're still there. They got the message, the word of the Lord told the prophet to say, thus says the Lord. They got that. They didn't obey. They hadn't obeyed. And you say, well, what, what didn't they obey? They didn't, uh, they, they, God told them not to fear the gods of the Amorites, right? Is that the only thing they didn't obey? Look at this, look at this phrase. I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. These people knew what that was. The people of Israel knew what that phrase was, where that phrase was from. And maybe, you, maybe you're, you're thinking, I know where that phrase was from. I've heard that phrase before. But maybe, maybe you haven't. Let's see the next slide. God's got a problem with the nation. Let's see the next slide. There it is. Look at this. Genesis chapter 20. I'm sorry, Exodus. Look at that, look at that, how that starts out. Verse 1. It says, And God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The point is, when the when the prophet said that same phrase, the people knew the Ten Commandments. They knew how it all started with that phrase. He was telling them, hey, you haven't kept my commandments. Remember, this is Exodus. We haven't got to Leviticus. All they have is the Ten Commandments. Eh, they have some rules about how to do uh, uh, tabernacle worship. They have some of that. But they don't have the other 600 and, uh, 603 laws that in the Old Testament. They just got the Ten. So God is like, God is reminding them about the Ten Commandments when he says that phrase. Those Israelites would have known that that's a quote from the, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. Now, if you look at the Ten Commandments, I think we have another slide for that. Commandment number, number one, have no gods before me. Commandment number two, don't make any graven image that looks like anything that's in the air, the, on the earth, or in the water below the earth. Commandment number, the second part of this commandment says, not only don't you make these idols, but you don't worship or serve them. And then the next one is the third says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the fourth says, hey, remember the Sabbath. It's my Sabbath. It's the Sabbath to the Lord. It's the Sabbath to remember the Lord. Those are just the first four. Those four focus on God. How God <coughs> wants us to behave towards him. 
The other six focus on how we behave towards each other. The first four is all about God. And what is he saying in these four, ver these four commandments? He's saying, basically, I'm number one. I want to be first. You keep the commandments because I'm number one. I'm God. If, if you, those of you that were with us in the Canvas uh, video study, remember what, what the, the teacher said was God's first three priorities? In God's world, since he's the supreme, he's the greatest, he's the big guy, he's the boss, he's the creator, he's everything, and everything that we observe is from him that he created, even ourselves. Remember? He knit us together while we were still in our mother's womb. He created us individually. He's the great God. And the first three priorities for God is his glory, his glory, and his glory. God And God hammers the, home, the point home four times here and says, I'm number one. You got to put me first. What did they just do? They just put God at the end of seven years of misery. That's what they had just done. They waited seven years before they cried out to the Lord. I wish I could say I never waited seven years for something, to, to ask God or to believe God for something. But, but we do. We do those things. We're not that much different from these people in a way. And the Sabbath is supposed to be for the Lord. You keep it because it's his day. Here we are. Now, that's the message of the preacher, the prophet. Midianites are still there, and all their un unnumerable, unnumerable camels are still there. Unnumberable. That's not a word. It's un unnumerable, I think is the right way to say it. All their camels are still there. They're still there. Uh, soldiers are still there. They're still up in the dens in the caves. Maybe with their goats or chickens. Whatever they could drag up there with them. Now, the next thing that we see is that uh, an angel is sent from God. Verse 11 says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abishrite, while his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. All right, next slide. So Gideon and the problem with the angel of the Lord. So there's a lot of problems going on here, right? Getting in the problem with the Midianites, the the problem with the living in the in the caves and the dens, and uh, and then the, the the angel comes to Gideon, and look what he's at. He's in this place. It says the angel was sitting underneath the terebinth, and there's Gideon, probably below in the wine press, beating out wheat. For food, for grain, getting the grain off the wheat stock. Now, number one, why was Gideon in the wine press? Well, the wine press is usually a, some kind of a fixture that's round or square, and they get in to smash the wine with their feet. That's how they produce the wine from the grapes. So it seems like Gideon was sent out down to the fields. Maybe the wine, the vines and of the grapes and the and the the wine press was up on the side of the hill. Maybe that's where they had the, the grape vines and they had the other crops down below where it was more flat. So he has to go. They sent Gideon to go get some food. Why did they send Gideon? Well, he was in the wine press trying to hide it. Now, later on in the story, uh, 
when Gideon finally comes around to doing what God asks, God tells him to go to go uh, tear down the altar of Baal or Baal and, uh, and, and uh, to build an altar to the Lord. And Gideon says, I am afraid. But Gideon said, okay, he said, I tell you what, God, I'll do it at night where nobody can see who's doing it. And, and, uh, and so Gideon, for that task, he takes 10 of the servants from his family. His family's that servant. All right, now these probably are not slaves. These are probably servants that were uh, owed a debt and, and somebody with resources would pay off the debt or they would say, and then say, well, I paid off this debt for you, so you're not, you're not in prison, so you've got to come and work for me for X number of years. Or they say, okay, you owe me money, and the way you're going to repay me, since you, got, you can't repay me, is that you have to work for me. And sometimes they, they would come, the people in these days would come and say, look, I've got this debt. Uh, I've got my, me, my wife, and, and a, a teenage kid, and a little boy, and we'll work for you for seven years if you'll help us, if you pay this debt. So they were like bound, right? They made a commitment. Uh, they're in this situation one way or another, and they're servants. But that meant that meant that that servants were valuable, right? And then and in the and then their culture, the oldest son inherited everything. Sometimes two sons got inheritance. If you're really rich, you'd have two sons getting inheritance. But only, but Gideon, Gideon wasn't very valuable. He was expendable. They sent Gideon out, right? Remember David? He was a young, young one. And he stayed back home to take care of the sheep while our bigger brothers went out to be brave army men, right? And so, and then when it was time to send some provisions of food to the brothers, they sent David, right? He wasn't important. He was not one of the, the, the top two sons, and he wasn't a big important in the family. Obviously, it seems that Gideon is not that important either. You got servants you could send to crawl through, down the hillside and into the wheat field, chop you off some wheat and crawl, take it back to the wine press and be beating out the wheat so you got some grain to make some bread for dinner. But they don't send the servants, they send Gideon. So you sort of see where Gideon is on the, in the pecking order. He's at the bottom, he's expendable. Uh, I don't know that how many sons that he had, but he had uh, enough that Gideon wasn't important. He wasn't going to be in on the inheritance, and these servants were important because they were valuable, more valuable to the family than Gideon. Next slide, please. All right, now, now we're going to talk about the problem that the angel had with Gideon. So the angel goes to Gideon, and uh, he's, he's the one that God has picked. And the angel says to him, where's your other paper at, Donald? The angel didn't say that. I did. Uh, so in verse 12, uh, the angel says, and I have this in blue and red. Oh, you can't see. Uh, Gideon's words are supposed to be in dark blue, but it's hard to see this dark blue. Can you see this dark blue? So this is the conversation. So the angel of the Lord, first he says, the Lord is with you. You know, the angel up underneath the, the terebinth seeing Gideon in the wine press. Gideon's in the wine press, and the, and the angel says to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon, I think he, he it sounds like he was looking around like, Who, who's that voice talking? Who's that guy talking to? So Gideon responds with this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put some sarcasm in this, so you'll see. You know, I'm not saying this is how he said it, but I sort of get the feeling he had some some attitude. Uh, so Gideon said to him, "Please, my lord." And when he says "lord" the first time, he doesn't use the word "lord." That it's not the word that's translated for "lord God." He says, but he says, if the Lord, and then from now on, he's using that word about God. He says, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us out of the land of Egypt? We've heard the stories of this great God, but 
Uh, we don't see him. But, and then he goes on to say, but now the Lord has forsaken us. And given us into the hand of many. God did this to us because he's just mean. The Lord has forsaken us. And given us in the hand of Midian. He's, he's, not, he's, not, uh, he's not really being friendly with this angel, is he? He tells the angel it's all God's fault. That's another thing that reminds me of myself. You know, when something bad happens I don't like. It's, uh, you know, it's like, God, why did you do this? Why did you let this happen to me? Right? We're that way. I think that's sort of why I like the story of Gideon. He reminds me of me. And of us, people. We're people. We're, all, we're, we're this way a lot with God. And so there, there we have it. The angel's having to deal with, a, with, a, uh, with the person that's supposed to turn out to be the hero that is acting like a zero. And it's like, he's not paying attention. He's not listening to what God is doing. The Lord has given us into the hand of Midian. Now, the next slide should show you the next part where the angel responds and says, he says, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Now this, this is why I think he's got, Gideon has an attitude. Right? Because he's talking big and bad to this angel. Like, this is the way it is, Mr. Angel. It's all God's fault. And the angel just turns around, and maybe, maybe Gideon's thinking, um, so let's look down here at this, at the, this next part. It says, uh, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Who am I, he says. So he's sort of saying that, look, this nation is overridden for seven years in a row by these other people, and we're just totally trounced. So we're like the weakest nation in the world. And my tribe... Manasseh is the weakest tribe of the 12 tribes. It's the weakest. And then within that, the clan, there's a clan of, of families. And within that, my, my father's house is the weakest. And I'm the least person in my father's household. That's why I've been sent out here to get this food and hide from the, from the Midianites. He said, look, I'm the least of the least of the least. You've got the wrong guy. You, you've come to the wrong guy. It's not me. I'm the last person anybody with any sense would pick to save Israel from the Midianites. That's his attitude. I'm the least. You come to the wrong, the wrong clan, the wrong family, the wrong tribe. So, you know, in the modern day, you know, for us, maybe us older ones, remember in the yearbooks? When you graduated high school, they would, they would put some moniker by your name, and Gideon would be like, hey, Angel, look at here. My, my high school yearbook says, Least likely, under my picture, least likely to deliver Midian. I mean, deliver the Israelites from Midian. He's like, you got the wrong guy. You, you got my name mixed up in the resumes. You, you, somehow you got it mixed up and you came to the wrong guy. I'm not that guy, he's saying. You got the wrong guy. I'm the weakest. I'm the last guy you should be coming to. That's what he's saying. I'm the least in my father's house. Look at me, I'm, I'm hiding, and I was sent out to get the wheat. And the servants are back up safe in the cave. You got the wrong guy, God. In and, and verse 16 now, And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike Mid the Midianites as one man. Now, I'm not sure what he means by that. I'm not sure if he means, Gideon, you're going to just be one man, and you're going to go take care of all of them all by yourself. Or he's saying... Uh, you're going to strike them as though they're just one man. And you're going to win. But he says, you, that's what it says. It says, uh, I'll be with you. And uh, verse 16, but 
I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So maybe he was thinking the story of the Samson and the jawbone of the donkey that killed all those people. Or maybe Gideon was thinking, there's more than one of them. We can't even count them. But it's, it's not very good odds, but the angel is saying, you're going to defeat them, strike the Midianites as one man. Like, and maybe, maybe I think he's got, Gideon's got an attitude because he's, you know, he's, he might be like, I would, if it was me, I would be in that rhyme prayer saying, why isn't somebody from one of those other tribes that are strong, one of the strong tribes, one of the strong families, beating my wheat and getting their grain from the stalks, saying, why doesn't somebody from one of the prominent families, one of the influential families, send out some young, strong, brave, uh, like the army officer, to gather the people and go take care of these Midianites. Somebody somewhere needs to do something. Right? And whenever God is doing stuff in our lives, we're always trying to tell God it's his fault. Or why don't you get somebody, God, to fix this? But if God is dealing with us, with me, it's more than likely God wants me to do something. Even though I don't think I can, even though I think that there's other people much better, more qualified than me, that could do it. And there he is. This angel's having a problem with Gideon. You could say this is the part where the angel, the angel of the Lord and the problem with Gideon. Gideon can be a real problem right here. That's why I think the angel, God sees something in him that he can, he's, He's, he's tired of this. He wants somebody else somewhere to do something. He wants God to do something or somebody else. And he doesn't even realize that God is standing right there. Hey, down in the wine press, you. Hey, you're it, Gideon. You're the guy that's going to do it. And Gideon doesn't see it. Just like we don't see it. You know, uh, this morning, Pat got a phone call. Hey, Pat, we're sick. Can you do some music this morning? <laughs> Tag, you're it. Bam. Wasn't that great this morning? And so it's good to have, you know, it's good that people are willing and flexible. Somebody once said the greatest ability is availability. And, and so, I mean, sometimes people have talent like Pat, and sometimes people are just available and, and are there to help out. And, and uh, so but you have to be available for God. Now, what verse are we on now? 32. All right, let's do the next, the next slide. See if that will remind me of where we're at. Oh, go back one. Go back. We're not ready for that one yet. Let's get down here to, to verse 17, I think. And the Lord said to him, I, I will be with you. You should strike many night as one man. And he said to him, if, if now, so Gideon said, if before, if the Lord is with us, why all this happens good? Now Gideon says, if, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is me, that is you to speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come and bring you out, bring out my present and set it before you. So what Gideon was doing, Gideon was saying, maybe this is somebody from God. Maybe I need to offer them something, an offering um, or a present or a gift and he says, in, in this translation it says present, so he says I need to bring you a present right, because if I bring you a present as though you're God, an offering as though you're God, people usually wouldn't pretend to be God because you would get struck down, bad things would happen to you, right and then he says he wants a sign, so is the sign is the sign just for him to stay around and see if he accepts his present as he's God. But um, you have to read the rest of the chapter to see all the signs that God, Gideon demands of God before he finally does something. <laughs> he's, it's like three or four or five signs that God has to show him before he does something. Because he's scared. And, uh, and God's going to show him some signs. And uh, he's going to be ornery the whole time, though. Want, more, want another sign? He wants a sign. He wants another sign and another sign. And uh, he, he just keeps testing God. Uh, perhaps the 
longer we test God, the more God's going to test us. I don't know. We should be careful about how, how often we trust God to test him. He's, he's the teacher. We don't get to get, he's the one that gives us pop quizzes. We, we're not supposed to be giving him tests. Now, in this, in this passage, you'll notice that when they're, when they're talking back and forth, uh, Gideon and the angel of the Lord, that God, this angel of the Lord, God never stops him, never strikes him, uh, Never shuts up his mouth like he did uh, in our other Wednesday night study about uh, Zacharias. And Zacharias didn't believe and God and the angel made him deaf, not deaf, speechless for uh, nine months. Excuse me. The, the angel never corrects Gideon. The angel doesn't say, no Gideon, you're wrong. You're not the least. You are strong, brave, and mighty man. The angel doesn't say, you know, you better stop that line or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. The angel never rebukes him at all in this story. <coughs> he goes on and on about he's not the right one and the Lord God did, has abandoned them and did, did this to them. The angel never rebukes him for that. And I would like to suggest to you that the reason the angel never says you're wrong is because he wasn't wrong. Hmm. What are you saying, Don? I'm saying he described his circumstances correctly. He, he didn't tell a lie, did he, about his circumstances? He, he didn't have no faith in himself. That's who he was. He was the least of his father's household. He was down there get, uh, getting the wheat and hiding from the many nights. He was there. That's his life. His circumstances was the way he described them. He didn't say anything that really wasn't true. He didn't, he didn't lie. That's, that's what, who he was. That's what he was doing. That was his circumstances. And he really did blame God. Sorry, Gideon. All this being true and you blaming God doesn't, doesn't get you off the hook. You're still, I've, I've, I've come here to pick you. You're it. Now, what God, what the angel of the Lord said, what God see, saw in him was also true. Follow me now. What Gideon said was true, what the angel said was true. But they sound like two different people. And the point is, what God says is true about you is more true about you than what you see is true about yourself. What God said about Gideon was true because that's what God saw. Gideon said the truth because that's what he saw. But what God sees when he looks at us is greater than what we see when we look at ourselves. God sees the possibility. God sees what he can do if we're willing Take the challenge. God sees what he can do with us. Go on to the, to the last slide, would you? It should be a blank slide. Oh, here we go. Let's talk about this. I don't have this on my paper. I have to read it. Our journey is towards seeing what God sees in us. That's what the Christian life is about. And we know him through his word in the Bible. Pat, you want to come and start getting ready for your song? <laughs> All right. That's our journey. Our journey is we read the Bible for ourselves. We seek God. We seek him in his word. We seek him in prayer because we, we want to know God. And when we get to know God, we start hearing and knowing what God wants from us. And if we respond to God he, he, and keep reading and, and seeking after him, we'll grow. It's all about being in his word. And we know him through his words in the Bible, and that's the Christian journey. It's toward seeing ourselves as God sees us, or seeing God. The more we know God, the more we're going to know ourselves. 
So the whole Christian life is a journey towards God. And we have to be in his word. And we have to be in prayer as we make the journey. And Pat's going to sing a song uh, about part of the journey. About meeting with God in the garden. And as he does, just prayerfully contemplate uh, if you spend enough time with God in his word and in prayer. come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there no other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But it bids me to go, though his voice a whole, his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tell you that none other has ever Help us 
to learn you and to know you and to seek you. And show us what you would have us to do and how you have us to live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, uh, I forgot one important.